Well, welcome to another Wednesday virtual tasting of our featured Effen Beer of the Week. We've got a treat for you tonight. We're doing our Vienna. It's a Vienna style lager. So let's get right to the recipe, okay? So it's a 5.7 ABV beer with 37 IBUs. We did a half barrel batch and we used uh, four malts all from the Weiermann German malt, malting house. So here's what we did. So for a half barrel batch, which is 15 and a half gallons, it's got 66% of Weiermann's Vienna malt, which is 22 pounds. And then we've got uh, seven pounds of Weiermann Munich, which is 21% of the malt bill. And then we've got two pounds of Weiermann's Bohemian Pilsner, which is a floor malted version, which is 6%. And then we finish it off with two and a half pounds of Weiermann's Care Munich 3, which is really 80 on the uh, color scale. And that's 7% of the malt bill. We mashed it in at 154 degrees for 60 minutes. The water treatment is to get us as close to um, Vienna, Austria's water. And then we sparge it out with 170 degree water and collect all of our sugars in a boil kettle. And once we get that boil started, we start our 60 minute countdown. And we add, at 60 minutes, one ounce of German Northern Brewer hops which gives us 14 IBUs. And then at 30 minutes left in the boil, we add four ounces of um, Perlay hops, and we use only pellets, and that gives us another 23 IBUs. So that's the only hop additions. It's all about um, up front, a little bit of bitterness to take away some sweetness and a little bit of uh, flavor in the mouthfeel, but really no um, aroma uh, characteristics out of this one on the hop side. So then uh, we uh, boil for 60 minutes. We move to our fermenter. We move it over at 62 degrees. Now at 62 degrees, it's a little bit lower temp, and then we let it rise up to 68. That's the highest we let it get to. Um, you'll find out we do a little bit different because we only have ale producing ale um, fermenters, and so we're using German ale yeast from Imperial, which is out of Portland, and we use their Kaiser um, yeast. So let's take a look at that. It's got a color of a 12 on the uh, SRM scale, 12. It's got a nice, beautiful um, uh, bronze, uh, copper color. Um, we cold conditioned this at uh, 32 degrees for two weeks. They had a nice malty aroma. Oh, it's so smooth and gentle. It's got those wonderful uh, malty grains. Those German malt grains have a uh, much distinctive um, flavor profile. They're, um, they're robust, but they're very smooth and gentle. Um, and adding a lot of those Viennas, it gives us some of that uh, um, hard crystallized uh, formats, which um, has a, a hint of sweetness to it, but not overly. Um, nothing sharp about it. It's all about smooth blending. Finishes um, really don't get any warmth from the alcohol at 5.7, but it has a nice um, uh, dry, lightly sweet finish, but it's really not a sweet finish at all. This is a great fall beer. This is a beer for, uh, the, this is the end of Oktoberfest and really for the fall season. You want something that's a little bit richer in malt character. You want something that's gonna be a little bit more robust in flavor profile. Great, goes with great fall food um, characteristics as well. So things that are like, if you're gonna have stews and you're gonna have chilies and um, all those kinds of um, heavier, uh, you know, uh, saucy or meaty, uh, it'll go really good with that. It'll fit really well. So let's talk, we're going we're gonna to talk a little about the characteristics as it's recognized around the world. Then I'm going to give you a little history on the style. So Vienna Lager is a moderately rich German malt. Um, so you, you could either go primary with Vienna malt or Munich malt. And since we want all Vienna malt, that's going to be our character here. And when we read a little in the history, it's going to be kind of interesting why we did that. A light toasted malt aroma may be present. And it's very light on the malt. And it's going to be a similar um, but less intense in Oktoberfest. And usually Oktoberfest beers are going to be a little bit higher in alcohol than this. Um, and they are going to be a little bit more intense in their malt character. No fruity esters, diacetyl. I don't get any. Nice uh, noble hop aroma may be low to none, which we get none here. And the caramel aroma is inappropriate, and we don't get any of that in this beer at all. Amber to copper color, which we dialed in perfectly. And flavor soft, elegant, malty complexity, 
firm enough hop bitterness to have a nice balanced finish. It's exactly what I was uh, describing there. No roasted or caramel flavor. Fairly dry finish, both malt and hop bitters is present in the aftertaste. And that's exactly what we got. Just a little bit of that hop um, bitter uh, dryness and nice big malty finish. Delicious. Overall impressions would be soft, elegant, maltiness, dry uh, finishes with a dry finish. Gentle creaminess, moderate carbonation, smooth, moderately crisp. So um, let's talk about the history. It's kind of got an interesting history on this beer. And um, the, it, uh, it was introduced much to Europe with a crisp, crisp clean profile of modern bottom fermentation, which would grow to become one of the most popular beer styles in German-speaking realm. Now, bottom fermenting is a lager yeast, which, again, we're using a, an ale yeast here, so that's a big variance here because we don't have lager-producing um, vessels. Before promptly being forgotten to its native land, it would disappear from Europe within 60 years of its arrival, and only a brief Austrian foothold in the New World would allow this to survive. In 1841, Anton Dreher became the king of beer when he revolutionized brewing by combining lightly kilned malt with lager yeast. This new style would predate Bohemian Pilsner by a year, making it arguably the first pale lager in the world. But let's back it up from the beginning of the story. So I'm going to grab a drink and I'm going to start giving you a little bit of history here. In 1820, Franz Anton Dreher, he died, and he left his Klein Schweit brewery to his 10-year-old son. Can you imagine being 10 years old and be given a brewery to run? Um, we're talking about 1820, a whole different time in the world. He was way too young to take over the operations. So instead, in the late 1820s, so he's probably in his um, 18, 19 years old, he started br his brewing education in anticipation of taking over the brewery, so he undertakes an apprenticeship journey, visiting a series of breweries around Europe. At the same time, another young brewer, Gabriel Saddlemeyer II, son of Gabriel Saddlemeyer, owner of Spaten Brewing, which is a very famous German brewery, is also making the same journey of learning. Somewhere along their travels, the two met and became quite good friends to make the remaining travels together. At this time in the early 1830s, so now Franz is probably in his uh, about 25 years old, a new kilning technology had come into use in England. Up into the, 19, into the 1700s, malt was kilned directly over the fire, creating a malt, dark malt in color with a strong, toasty, sometimes smoky profile. But by the early 1800s, the British were refining the way to dry the malt using hot air instead of direct heat imparting a lighter color to the malt in a more delicate profile. Dreher and Settlemeyer learned of this new technology when visiting English breweries, and it seems they have gone as far as stealing samples of the wort and yeast from some of the breweries for later analysis. What take they, they, they learn legally and illegally back to their respective home cities in 1836, Dreher takes his place to the head of his father's brewery. So now that's 16 years later, so he's 26 years old and he's taking over control of the brewery. Using his gainly, newly gained knowledge, he started experimenting with the English way of kilning and creates an amber malt that is just slightly caramelized. And he calls it Vienna malt. And he promptly combines it with lager yeast, brewing a reddish copper lager and delicate, slightly bready malt profile. And he released the beer in 1841 as Vienna lager or lager Vienna or the Vienna style lager beer. So there's the history, pretty interesting on how that became and that makes a lot of sense why I would use the Vienna malt as our base malt in this beer. It is a nice bready, um, but it's a much different kind of a bready characteristic than using the English malt. Delic delicious and delicately smooth and it's just wonderful. I'm gonna bring this a little closer so I can see some of these comments coming through. And let's see, we've got Kim and Cindy and Kathy and Mark and Dan and Stephanie and Daryl, Butch, Connie, Lee, Neil, and Zach says, is this, is this a German beer from Austria? Well, it's an Austrian beer, but if you think about their, uh, the, the, uh, 
the journey of finding it. So it was a German brewer and an Austrian brewer that went to England and found those malts, uh, make, a way of making the malts. And so that really is kind of a, a hybrid there, but uh, Vienna is where the beer came from. So I would say it's an Austrian beer, but we're using German ingredients. Yeah, we got Zach and Chris and Julia. Zach says, uh, so the Vienna Lager is related to the Oktoberfest. It very much is. And it's, it's also um, got a lot of other uh, German beer um, relatives there. So as far as the German Effen beers, we've got this one and the MLK Alt, right? Correct. And there's an Effen Alt beer. That's right, Chris. We did a, another version of an alt beer, and we called it the Effen Alt beer. It's got quite a bit different profile, and I'd like to maybe do that again sometime. And yes, the MLK Alt is brewed every year on MLK Day. We got Dave and Nancy watching. We got Donica, and we got Kathleen. And Chris says, "Do loggers require different equipment than ales in order to brew?" Well, they really do to do it properly because um, we're talking about um, ales are top fermenting yeast, and so when you have a conical fermenter that goes small on the bottom, uh, when the yeast is active, converting the sugars uh, to alcohol, it's being on the top, so it's the widest part of the opening, and it brings all the sugars to the top, and it converts them to alcohol, and the uh, resulting pressure of CO2 evaporates, and that's why you get the bubbling in your fermenter. Think of the opposite, using lagers, which is bottom fermenting yeast. It's not very effective doing it in a conical fermenter because the surface area is very small down there and you're not going to uh, get a very good fermentation. So they tend to be um, uh, shorter and wider fermenters to give you more f surface area to do all that fermentation. So if you walk into a brewery um, that has different shapes, you would probably know if they're, um, they may have both types of fermenters in, in their uh uh, brewing arsenal so they can do both styles of beer. But one that is primarily lagers is going to have different equipment than primarily ale producing breweries. It's a good question, Chris. Zach says, so Foggy Noggin has English, Irish, and German beers. Any other countries I'm missing? Well, we do some American beers too. So we, uh, you know, we do the Bothell IPA, which is all American. Um, Skittles IPA is all American. Um, and I think we've, you know, the Effen, uh, the uh, American Fresh Hop is all American. So we, we do some American beers as well. But uh, mainly English, a little Irish, and a little Scottish too. You're missing the Scottish. And those being the UK region would be England, Scotland, and um, Ireland. So I'm going to quickly go over this recipe again and just keep firing those questions off because this is what makes it really fun is getting those questions and having two-way dialogue or four- or five-way dialogue, dialogue if we all want to talk to each other. So the Vienna Lager is 5.7% alcohol, 37 IBUs. We did a half barrel batch. We used four malt ingredients, and we used all from Weiermann. So we used their um, Vienna malt, which was 66% of our malt bill, 22 pounds. Their Munich, 7 pounds for 21%. Bohemian Pilsner, 2 pounds for 6%. And Kara Munich, 3, 2.5 pounds for 7%. Mashed in 154 degrees for one hour sparge it with 170 degree water, collect all of the sugars into the boil kettle, and once the boil starts, we start our 60 minute countdown. At 60 minutes, we add one ounce of Northern Brewer, which is German grown, and we get uh, 14 IBUs, and at 30 minutes off, we use the pearly hops, four ounces for 23 IBUs. Move it to the fermenter at 62 degrees, let it rise to 68, using the Imperial Kaiser yeast. And that's how we did it, and I would secondary condition this for two weeks to get your clarity and get um, uh, just make this thing have a little bit of lagering character to it. Chris says, how similar or dissimilar are German and English styles in general? Well, most German styles are going to be lagers. So you got Pilsners and lagers, and, um, but they do a fair amount of um, ales too because they do the alt beer, the Kolsch beer. Um, they do um, some uh, wheat beers that are using ale yeast, the Dunkels, um, but their their ingredients are going to be different using German grown malts and um, you know we've got those uh, Vienna malts and Munich malts and the Pilsner malts, much different character and flavor than the the, the English malts. So they're quite a bit different. First German beer brewed was the MLK Alt. 
Was it a hard decision to try a German beer moving outside of the UK? Well, not when I'm talking about the alt beer, because that is one of my favorite beer styles. And so, you know, you kind of, being that that's actually an ale that's brewed like a lager, but um, alts use a ale yeast, and that really, um, to me, was like the Germans trying to be English brewers. That's my whole take on it, and that's why I want to try it. Uh, did you modify the water for German styles like when you make the London water? Yes, we used uh, Vienna water on this one, so it's going to be quite a bit harder water. Um, uh, Zach says, I love Kolsch's. They're so well balanced. Yeah, so Ger Kolsch's and Alts and Vienna's are very well balanced beers. They're, they're really, really nice. Um, so, yeah. This is a great beer. Now, they call... Um, I think Negro Modelo, a uh, Vienna-style lager, which um, is a whole different take on this, but it is a very well-balanced, uh, multi-rich beer in uh, from in Mexico. And a lot of German brewers, when they came over to start breweries in North America, um, brought their uh, German brewing skills, and they were brewing German and um, in Austria being next door. Uh, you get some of those Vienna styles as well. So a lot of influence there in uh, Mexico and, and American in Canada for German style. So uh, let's see. Uh, that's This beer is going to be on tap for growler fills this weekend, Friday and Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. This is $16 for a half-gallon growler. And we will... Um, we will have for this weekend, I think we'll have 30 growler fills. So we have a lot of them. I don't think we'll run out. And we actually did a second batch of that. So um, it's a popular beer and it's going to be around for a little bit while. I encourage you to get it. I think it's perfect time of year to have it with a um, cooler nights. Um, it's nice to get out in the sun with a beer when it comes out in the fall. But then you get nice cooler nights and then we're going to start eating a little bit more heartier meals. And this goes really good with that because uh, that's... It just is a really well-balanced beer that's not going to overtake the food, but it's going to complement it really well. And so you go to the FoggyNogginBrewing.com website, hit the beer tab. All the details for this week's beers are there. We have uh, eight beers for growler fills. We have a bunch of great bottle selection, and you can get your Foggy Noggin merchandise like this shirt, this hat, and many other things if you just want to peruse on, on that uh, page. You email it to us. We send you an invoice, and it's ready when you come pick up on Friday or Saturday. So... Lots of fun for that. It's a good. It's going to be a great weekend for um, for drinking beer because uh, we're going to have some stormy weather coming through Friday, and we got the Seahawks coming up on Sunday, and we do have the cease and desist Skittles IPA back in stock, and so you can get growler fills and bottles of that. So you want to make sure you get those so you've got them. Um, let's see. Um, here in Texas, we're flooded with German breweries and the beer halls. They taught many people in Mexico how to brew. You're right, Chris. Um, Texas is a, a, a big German influence on their beer. Zach says, what food pairings? And I, again, I think that uh, heartier things, stews and chilies and, um, you know, pot roast and pork chops and all those kinds of things. Things with sauces would be great. Um, be a lot of fun. And by the way, the Blackberry Beaver was absolutely delicious. Well, I'm glad you liked it. I think I've got a growl or two left. So if you want them, you have to inquire to see if we've got any left. Um, uh, that was a very popular beer, and it just flew out of here. And I thought it was fantastic, too. Welcome, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Zach says, what's the best effing beer to drink something during a storm? Well, it depends how threatening that storm and if it's, you know, I want to go, um, I would probably say, say anniversary ale might be my favorite storm beer and i'd also want to go with maybe one that's maybe about uh three four or five years old i think that's because you think about it, it's like what if i lose power what if i lose um all my ability to keep my beer at the perfect temperature and you know you gotta start drinking that stuff so if it goes bad i'm gonna drink it before it goes bad and so if i've been storing a beer for a number of years and loss of power is an option i'm gonna go for the 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 longer aged beers I've got, and I'm going to drink them before uh, they go bad. Now, hopefully they don't go bad, but I still get to enjoy a great beer. So tomorrow we're doing our virtual um, happy hour. Um, it's going to be live this week. We did an um, encore performance last week.
but you know, it was at 5.30, and you know, those of you who are planning on watching the presidential debate that starts at 6, it's a great warm-up for you. It's going to put you in a good frame of mind to um, either watch or not watch. So join us at 5.30, and you make a choice if you're going to watch the debate or not. But uh, 5.30, we're going to have a little song, a little music, a little uh, singing, a little, little humor, and it's really, it's the best half hour of the week. So you're going to want to make sure you tune in on Facebook Live tomorrow at 5.30, for happy half hour time. Uh, what is the best F and uh, the storm? We already asked that question. I thought it was a new one coming through. So next week we are going to be featuring um, the double coconut duck. And that's the first time we've done that book, uh, beer. So double coconut duck is next week. And I'm really looking forward to tasting that. And so when I've when we ever release a beer that I've never had before, which the Double Coconut Duck's brand new beer, you're going to watch me taste it for the very first time. And so you can see how my face may be kind of, or really excited because it's really good. So Double Coconut Duck next week, and I'm looking forward to it. That's a big beer. It's going to be very limited. It's one that you're going to want to get your hands on too. So we've done, we do Vienna usually this time each year, and I know it's one of the favorites. I think we do it twice some other times, but, um, you know, it's a very popular, we have some people who just love it and rave about it, so I'm sure we're going to have a big following for pickups this weekend. Um, I have curbside pickup Friday and Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. Chris says, how far ahead do you plan your brew days? So we try to plan six weeks in advance um, so we can source our ingredients, and then we can actually um, perform the brewings with a, it's hard to do a brewing when you don't have the right ingredients. So, Zach, double your pleasure, double your duck. When double duck has coconut, you definitely in luck. That's a great tagline there. So, uh, kind of sounds like that um, double mint gum kind of thing. Put a little music to it, and you got yourself a little jingle. So, maybe you could uh, do that for us next week, Zach. Provide us that little jingle. You can sing it. What do you think? Are you up for the challenge? <laughs> Well, I appreciate you guys all joining us, and um, thanks for um, spending a little bit of time with us, learning about the Vienna, a little about the history on the Vienna Lager, and now you know about how we make it. If you're a home brewer, um, you've got some tips, and you know, don't be afraid to, to, to do it your own way, too, but you've got some basic things on what we do, and I'm really happy with the beer we make, so um, it's always fun. <clears throat> it's always fun to try new things. So... Um, Tomorrow, 5.30, happy half hour. Next Wednesday at 6 o'clock is double coconut duck virtual tasting. And virtual. we have our curbside pickup both Friday and Saturday this weekend, 4 to 5 p.m. And go to the FoggyNogginBrewing.com website and hit the beer tab, and you get all the details on what's out there. And Zach says he will sing it, so we're looking forward to that. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and have a great and safe evening. <laughs>